Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for uh, Palliative Care and Geriatrics Grand Rounds. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kathleen Doyle, and I am the um, Fellowship Director. And I have the honor of introducing Alex Wynn, one of our uh, Palliative Care Fellows. Alex received her bachelor's degree in math and physics from the University of Michigan. She then uh, went on to get her medical degree at the University of Rochester, and upon graduation did a residency in internal medicine at um, UCLA, uh, UCLA Medical Center in um, Los Angeles. Uh, she's been a palliative care fellow here with us for the last year, and she will be returning to California uh, to be a palliative care physician um, with Kaiser uh, next year. Thank you, Alex. Hello, can you hear me okay? Thank you. As you all know, physician aid in dying is an emotionally charged topic. And too often the patient perspective and narrative are lost in the midst of a lot of ethical and legal debate over the years. As cl clinicians, our perspective can be divergent regarding how we view physician aid in dying. And today, I hope to spend some time sharing with you what I have learned uh, from exploring this topic, and hopefully we can get a better understanding of the patient narrative. I have no financial disclosure uh, in this presentation. The learning objectives for today include comparing the attitudes of physician with those of terminally ill patients toward physician aid in dying. Exploring how patients' perceptions of anticipatory suffering inform their decision to pursue a hastened death. And assessing the extent of palliative care provided to patients who have considered or chosen physician-assisted death. Uh, before del delving into the data, I just want to take a few minutes to go over the definitions of some of the terms that will be used today throughout this presentation. Uh, first, physician aid in dying is defined as a physician providing at the patient's request a prescription for a lethal dose of medication that the patient can self-administer, usually by ingestion. And this is also known as physician-assisted death or physician-assisted suicide in the literature or in the media. Um, and as you know, the word suicide um, can uh, essentially pass a lot of judgment. And so uh, as a medical community, we have, we have sort of uh, go against that. And uh, we try to use a more neutral term as physician aid in dying. Uh, the main difference between euthanasia and physician aid in dying is who uh, administers the lethal drugs. Uh, so instead of a prescription given to the patient and the patient ingests it themselves, uh, in this case, the physician directly, directly administers the lethal drugs. And euthanasia is illegal everywhere in the U.S., uh, only legal in some of the European countries. Um, another term that will be often used is the term hasten death. And this is a neutral term uh, that is often used by the patients themselves uh, who seek medical aid in dying, regardless of whether it's euthanasia or physician aid in dying. Uh, this is the current map of the states that allow physician aid in dying, and you can see all of them are in yellow here. Um, the uh, earliest state that passed such law called the Death with Dignity Act is Oregon in 1997. And the latest day that passed that law is Hawaii as of January of 2019. So currently we have seven states plus the District of Columbia. So when we look at public attitude uh, toward physician aid in dying, um, uh, we can look at the result, the Gallup polls that have done over the years, and this is since 1996 until 2018. And you can see that uh, when the public is asked this question, when a person has a disease that cannot be cured and is living in severe pain, do you think doctors should or should not be allowed by law to assist the patient to commit suicide if the patient requests it? The two important points is that the patient is in severe pain and the word that you is commit suicide. So based on this question, about two thirds of the public support physician aid in dying. And you can see that despite a lot of legal and ethical debates over the years, this number hasn't really changed very much. It still remains about two thirds. So 
public perceives pain as the most acceptable reason for medical aid in dying, but if you change the way you ask the question, instead of intractable pain, severe pain, you ask, can the patient request aid in dying if they have functional debility, if they feel like they're a burden on their family, if they view life as meaningless. So if the reason for requesting physician aid in dying become more existential, the public tend to not support it as much. The number dropped from two thirds to about one third. Um, but this is actually different on how patients view death and dying. So when you look at a lot of these surveys that have done over the years, and in this case, it's done you know, on ALS patients, on patients with HIV AIDS, uh, there's a couple of studies with cancer uh, patients here. You can see that uh, what I circle in red uh, right here, you can see a lot of them say depressive symptoms, depression, hopelessness, more hopelessness, more depressive symptoms. So pain actually is not perceived by the patient to be the main motivator for medical aid in dying, but usually is other existential psychological distress. So how does depression um, or hopelessness affect the patient's desire for hasten death? Uh, this is a study done by uh, Brebart in colleague, and um, I just want to point out a few things that in this study, um, they study about 90 terminally ill patients, and the patient actually were admitted to uh, inpatient palliative care hospital in uh, New York. Uh, so uh, they are there for symptom management or end-of-life care, and you can imagine that that would be the place to get optimal palliative care. And despite optimal palliative care, uh, they found that terminally ill patients with major depression were four times more likely to have high desire for haste and death compared to a uh, patient without major depression. And they also didn't find any significant association between pain or haste, desire for haste and death because they already receiving optimal uh, pain management in the hospital. Um, and because depression, hopelessness are such a big concern, so taking uh, Oregon death with dignity law, for example, um, in this little excerpt right here said, no medication to end a patient's life in a humane and dignified manner shall be prescribed until the person performing the counseling determined that the patient is not suffering from a psychiatric or psychological disorder or depression, causing impaired judgment. And the reason is because when you think of depression causing suicide, you think of the patient having impaired judgment. And the law essentially excludes patients with depression from pursuing physician aid in dying, although it's unclear once the patient gets referred to a counselor, get treated, and their depression are well controlled, we don't know if they'd be allowed to pursue physician aid in dying again. So, you know, this is a pre-existing condition issue, and I don't know if anyone has a good answer to that. So when a patient comes to us clinicians and asks us to help them die, um, when I was a resident in Los Angeles where it was first legalized in around 2018 or so, uh, the patient say, could you please help me die? I mean, I was a resident and I was very shocked. I didn't know how to answer, so I said, um, let me get you my attending. <laughs> so then the attending came and was like, what's going on? So I said, well, the patient just asked me to help you know, him die. And I know it's legal, but I don't know what to do about it. And I'm a resident, so I'm off the hook. So it's all yours. And the patient in the uh, attending said, why don't you consult palliative care? So then we consulted palliative care and we had one palliative care physician in the 500 bed county hospital. So this person is very busy, and um, he was not very acquainted with the law, and there's no policy in the county system that mentioned, you know, what to do about it, and they receive federal funding, and, you know, by federal law, this is not legal, and you wouldn't get Medicare reimbursement, so then nobody knows what to do about it, and the patient was left, you know, not having an answer, and it was very frustrating. Um, so when I think of, you know, a patient coming and ask physician to help them die, maybe it's a way to express other unspoken concerns. Um, and in this paper by uh, Dr. Janet Abram, she mentioned a few uh, things that we should pay attention to. Maybe when the patients say, I wanna die, it means that they're crying for help with their uncontrolled physical symptoms. 
or maybe they're just seeking acknowledgement of their existential suffering. Uh, Sometimes, because physicians don't talk about death and dying enough, the patient just wants to have better communication and want to learn more about the dying process. And of course, there are patients who want to preserve a sense of dignity at the end of life. Looking at study of dignity is a very hard thing to study. And I found this uh, qualitative analysis. Um, and this includes patients not just in the US, but some in Europe and some in Asia as well. And there are three domains um, that influence the patient perception of dignity. And it all kind of interplay in the patient's quality of life. Uh, first is loss of functionality perceived as loss of control. Um, and that's when patients lack the ability to do their ADLs. Uh, they don't feel value in their life because they don't get to do what they enjoy doing. The other part is uh, patient's self-identity. Um, it's affected when they have lower self-esteem, uh, when they have different physical image um, uh, of themselves. Uh, for example, you know, I had a patient who said, I couldn't look into the mirror because I lose my hair, for example. Or, patients feel like they are perceiving differently uh, by their uh, social counterparts. Um, and also along with that is a fear of being a burden. Um, and the last part that is emphasized a lot in uh, physician aid in dying law is respecting patient autonomy. And autonomy here is understood as a desire for control over the dying process. Uh, so the patient, you know, worries about the future and they want to have control of what's gonna happen in the future, knowing that when they get to that point, they may not be able to tell their care providers what they would like to be done. So, for patients who initially express interest in physician aid in dying, uh, what are they really motivated by? So, this study looked at Oregon patients um, who were recruited through either advocacy organization or uh, they come to their uh, primary care physician or their oncologist and uh, they express interest, um, uh, initial interest in physician aid in dying. And you can see that on this table, uh, the median score of five is the highest score you can get, and this is the most important reason for them to consider uh, aid in dying. And you can see that a lot of fear about uh, future qu poor quality of life, future pain, future inability to care for self. So they worry about, a lot about the future, and these worries, you know, have anticipation in nature. And um, but at this time of request, they actually do not believe that their life is poor in quality or meaningless or worthless, and their desire to die is not strong. So if you tell them that I have the prescription to give you right now, will you take it? They will say, no, I don't want to take it now. I just want it for the future. Uh, and so how often are these requests granted? So looking at the physician experiences in Oregon, uh, they grant about one in six requests. Um, and one in 10 of those requests will result in uh, death by ingestion of the lethal medications. The most interesting part is here, about half of the patient changed their mind with substantial palliative care intervention. And substantial palliative care intervention here is defined as um, uh, treating pain, referring to um, palliative care physician, referred to hospice program, social work, chaplain, uh, referred to psychiatric counseling, prescribed antidepressants, and so on. And so that is the important part is that people change their mind. So looking at the actual data uh, in Oregon, um, we can see that from 1998 until 2018, uh, more people are you know, requesting physician aid in dying prescription. And there were about um, a total of the green light right here. So the area under the curve, that's about 2,200 uh, prescription that were actually granted. But not all of those patients actually, you know, ingested the medications that were provided to them. So only about two thirds of the patient that received a prescription actually die from ingesting the medication. So even when you have the prescription, you may decide not wanting to take it. Or you may feel too weak or for whatever reason to actually take, you know, the 100 pills of cyclobarbital because it's a lot of pills. It's 10 grams of medication. And looking at the demographics, this is also interesting. Um, when back in the 90s, when they first considered drafting uh, death with dignity law, there are a lot of worries that the law is going to be biased. Um, 
you know, toward uh, African American people from uh, minority ethnic groups, people who are not educated, uh, people who have lack of access to healthcare, but this data suggests otherwise. So we know that majority overwhelmingly are Caucasian patients. They actually tend to be well educated. Um, they actually, almost all of them have health insurance uh, in some form and uh, you know, most of them are all, the median age is about 74 and majority have cancer diagnosis. Uh, and actually these are more solid tumors, uh, very, very few uh, hematologic malignancies here. And so uh, all physicians in Oregon who provide these prescription are required to report uh, what are the reason that the patient consider uh, physician aid in dying. And so these are still reported by physician, but it's reported after the physician have had discussion with the patients. And um, losing autonomy is like overwhelmingly 95% of patients report that's one of the main reason. Less able to engage in activities, making life enjoyable is another one, and loss of dignity. And it, it dropped to about 50% of patients reporting maybe physical symptoms. And then only a third say that inadequate pain um, is what they really concern about. And because these uh, concerns are reported by the uh, physicians, it's interesting to understand the physician perception of these patients as well. So patients who request physician aid in dying are perceived to have a strong desire to remain independent and in control of the dying process. And the patient um, were perceived as projecting the fear of dependence onto their families and, and they view their dependence as burdensome. Um, and this is the most important point I want to make is that the physician think that these requests by the patient are clear, are adamant and unwavering, which I will show you in the next couple of slides that it's actually not quite um, so unwavering. So uh, this study by permanent colleagues, uh, he sort of did a qualitative study, and instead of looking at just first request, he looked at the patient from initial request until they die. Uh, and so it's a longitudinal study. And um, based on the patient report, uh, their concerns are sort of uh, divided into three categories. We have the uh, illness-related experiences, we have the fears about the future, and we have sort of self-identity, uh, dignity uh, category. And uh, we know from this study, they learned that the patient actually, before coming to uh, the idea that, you know, they want the physician to help them die, they actually have considered this over a very prolonged period of time. So it's not a rash de decision. They thought about it long and hard. And even though they thought about it long and hard, over time, that also changes. And it's also... And, and not just the, the decision to die or not to die, but also uh, why they would want to pursue it. So maybe at you know, some point in the past, it was the pain crisis that you know, make them feel like they don't have as much will to live, but later on, maybe it's an existential crisis, then they all kind of play along with each other. And so no patient have one single reason um, to motivate them to die, but there could be multiple reasons that has sort of intertwined with one another at the, at the same time. Um, and this is another interesting study. So in this study, um, they look at the patients um, who die of physician aid in dying, and uh, they comp sort of align that with the patient estimated prognosis at the time of death. And you can see that um, for patients who have sort of more than, would estimated to have more than six months to, to, uh, to live, they say they are, feel like they're not recognized by others as, as dying, but they still are suffering just the same. And so uh, the physical symptom may be unrelenting and they may go toward a downhill slope, uh, but they, not, they feel like they're not being viewed by their physician as they are suffering. And then if you get more towards sort of like the end of life where the prognosis one to four weeks or less than one week, the reason become more of an existential nature. And so these patients feel like I'm dying, but I'm not dying fast enough. Um, and so uh, this is uh, kind of encapsulates um, the whole idea. I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
Um, and we also, you know, often see patient in the hospital uh, toward the end of life, they say, I can't do it anymore, even if we get their symptom under control. Uh, so say, there's a lot of uh, distress um, sort of toward the end about why am I still here? Why am I already dead? Um, in in uh, the literature, there's the idea of response shift. And we don't see a lot of this phenomenon being explored in palliative care literature, but it's actually been used a lot to study quality of life uh, uh, research studies. And um, uh, it's a phenomenon in which uh, the patient sort of uh, view, perception uh, of uh, whatever that they're experiencing will change depending on sort of whatever else is happening to them, dependent on treatment um, and dependent on severity of their illness. And so um, you can see that, you know, patient will kind of swing between desire to die versus the will to live. And, you know, it just swing back and forth at the, as the trajectory of illness sort of uh, move forward and maybe in a declining pattern. Um, and so, you know, as much as we, you know, saw earlier in the study about physician perception, they think that the patient requests are uh, unwavering, um, are clear and adamant, you know, based on uh, this idea, uh, those requests are more ambivalent and unstable. And so it can, it need to be assessed repeatedly over time, instead of just say, I'm giving you the prescription and done. It's, it's sort of not an ultimatum, it's a continuum. And, and um, the desire to hasten death uh, has to be reassessed uh, repeatedly. Um, and, you know, this study sort of ported to that idea is that they look at a lot, they interview a lot of uh, patients um, who uh, seriously consider, um, you know, medical aid in dying. And what I want to point out is that when you look at this figure um, at the bottom right here, so of the 71 people who consider um, medical aid in dying on the initial interview, it dropped to 35 patients by the follow-up interview. And um, in the meantime, between the initial and follow-up interview is uh, about like 125 days, so about 18 weeks. Um, uh, depressive symptoms and dyspnea were associated with instability of aging dying requests. And in this study, they also found that African-American patients um, are more likely to oppose uh, medical aid in dying as well as uh, religious individuals. And I want to mention the time frame because in the next slide or so, we'll talk a little bit about how the law take this into account, the fact that the patient continue to change their mind. So uh, by Oregon's law, for example, the patient must make two oral requests uh, to the attending physician separated by at least 15 days. Why 15 days? I don't know, it's an arbitrary number. I actually have like, looked in the literature, couldn't find an answer. I've sort of uh, talked to uh, Dr. Susan Block, one of the experts, and she sort of mentioned that when they were drafting the laws, um, the proponent of the law wanted the patient to get a pres prescription right away at the first request. And so it's sort of a compromise that they come up with the 15 days. It's not really based on any study. So. Remember in the last slide, it's 125 days, here's 15 days. I mean, people can change their mind multiple times, you know, uh, between the first request and whenever they decide that it's time for them to die. So you look at the, the data on duration, so in days between first request and death. So uh, it's about 43 in 2018, but on average over time since 1990, it's about 47 days. So not much difference here. Uh, and this is about six and a half weeks. So it's faster than a lot of us would think is that, you know, people talk about the bureaucratic burdens, uh, some of uh, obtaining such a prescription, but from first request until death, it's about six and a half weeks. Um, so how do physicians, you know, respond to initial requests? And um, you, when you look at these two older studies, um, 
the good news is that physicians want to treat the patient better, so they would, you know, uh, increase palliative care uh, treatment uh, by physical symptoms, uh, treating pain, uh, use fewer life prolonging therapies, uh, refer to psychiatric uh, uh, clinic, or prescribe antidepressants. So, physician first response is, "I want to help them feel better." So that's a, a good response. Um, and uh, of no, uh, interestingly, physician experiences in end-of-life care also affect their attitudes. So this study looked at oncologists in the U.S. Um, and uh, the reason I want to point this out is because most of the patients who request aid in dying are cancer patients. Um, so oncologists who reported that um, they receive better training in palliative care are less likely to perform medical aid in dying. And, um, Oncologists support overall for physician aid in dying in the, you know, in case of a, a patient um, who is terminally ill and have unremitting pain. Uh, that number has continued to decline in this study over time, uh, and perhaps because they get better palliative care. Um, and we also found that physicians who are less spiritual are more likely to perform uh, medical aid in dying. Um, so even though um, uh, Based on you know uh, the AHPM sort of statement, take a stand you know uh, that uh, physician aid in dying uh, is sort of in a way sort of contrary to the philosophy of palliative care is that we treat the patient um, you know with the intention of increasing their quality of life and death is not the intended outcome, whereas aid, medical aid in dying the intended outcome you know is is causing ending the patient life. Uh, and when you look at the Canadian uh, Society of Palliative Care Physicians, you know, 80% of those physicians actually uh, uh, felt that physician aid in dying um, uh, shouldn't be pursued. Now, but when you look at this study, so this is a newer study done in Canada uh, because uh, physician aid in dying was recently legalized in Canada. So this is 2018. Um, patient may not view medical aid in dying and palliative care as mutually exclusive at all. Um, and in this study, they compare patients who never received palliative care, who just got enrolled in palliative care, and who have been receiving palliative care. And they found that um, patients with new and ongoing palliative care involvement reported higher levels of hypothetical consideration of physician aid in dying uh, than the ones without palliative care involvement. And that is contrary to the popular belief that palliative care may reduce the desire for hasten death. Um, and I think one of the reasons for this, possibly because uh, patients who receive palliative care tend to be sicker and they tend to think more about death and they're more informed about their options. We also encourage them to have advanced care planning and encourage them to talk about uh, the dying process. Uh, this is another interesting finding. It's a secondary outcome in this study. And the question that was asked was, who should provide the lethal prescription? And uh, because it was in Canada, so you look at the uh, physician who are part of the Canadian Palliative Care Society, about 75% of them you know, said that uh, they don't think it's appropriate for a palliative care physician to provide a prescription. You look at this survey, the patient believed that palliative care doctor, as much as oncologist internal or a family doctor should prescribe a uh, physician aid in dying prescription. So patients expect us to get involved. And uh, even though a lot of palliative care physicians don't feel comfortable uh, with this idea. And so what's in the prescription, uh, you may be wondering. Uh, we know that the number one medication that have been used is cecobarbital, is a barbiturate. Um, and 58% uh, of the patients in Oregon thus far have used uh, this medication. Uh, bentobarbital was available only initially in the 90s, and then uh, it was discontinued because uh, it's a medication using capital punishment, so the European Union decided not to ship that to the U.S. anymore. Um, and then there are two, you know, these uh, compounds called DDMP, and it's essentially just the acronym for diazepam, digoxin, morphine sulfate, and propanolol. And the difference between one and two, it's just the amount of morphine that is uh, in the prescription. So 10 grams versus 15 grams. So this is a lot, because usually we think of medication in terms of milligrams. Um, 
there's another compound uh, with phenobarbital in it, and it also includes chlorohydrate and morphine sulfate. This is known to actually burn really badly when you ingest by mouth. And so talking about, you know, dying without uh, suffering, this can be quite unpleasant for the patient uh, on, you know, anecdotal reports that uh, have been, like, have surfaced like, in the media. Um, and so the other one thing I want to mention is that these pre prescriptions are not always affordable. So um, why don't we just all use sickle barbital? It's supposed to work the best. Um, and it's, the reason is because you can see the price in 2010 was about 387 in 2016, it's almost $3,000. Um, and this is out of pocket cost. So this already taken insurance into account. And a lot of insurance don't actually reimburse for this. And because cyclobarbital has become so expensive, patient would resort to the auto compounds. Um, so you can see that phenobarbital cocktail, it can burn, but it's only $500. And and this matters because when the patient, for the patient who want to have control of the timing of their death, cyclobarbital average time to induce a coma at the dose that they prescribe is about five minutes. And the median time of death uh, is about 20, 25 minutes. If you take these auto compound, phenobarbital, that time can lengthen. And if you take the DDMP compounds, that can take days. So you can have delay in inducing coma um, and death, or you can have pretty fast coma, but delay in death, and it's a distress for the family. Um, and so that is something to consider, um, especially when you look at the complication of ingesting these medication. And this is a complication of all the prescription combined, not to any uh, single medication. Uh, you can see that there's, you know, small, but uh, we're talking about life and death here, so it matters. Uh, difficulty in injection medications, not too much seizures, and then half of these deaths, we don't know what the complications are because we don't have the data from the family. And uh, a lot of patients toward the end of life, they have issue with dysphagia or nausea. And when you ask them to ingest 10 grams of cyclobarbital, it's a lot of pills. It's like the whole bottle. And there have been cases of people vomiting and they have really bad nausea and could only ingest half and couldn't ingest the whole thing. Um, so it could be very distressing for the patient and the family. Um, and then right here where, you know, say a patient regained consciousness, like what happened with them? Are they gonna go back and get a second request? Um, you know that in the Netherlands and Belgium, if a patient ingests the medication and they don't die, the physician are allowed to push a lethal medication by, the, by IV, through the IV, so that can help you know, um, hasten their death. But here in the US, euthanasia is illegal. So if the patient you know, took the medication and ended up not dying, there's not much else that a physician could do to help them. And you can imagine the amount of existential distress for this patient. And another thing I thought was interesting to look at was the, the duration of patient-physician relationship. Um, you know, as you can see, many patients would know their physician for a very long time. So this is in weeks. Um, so there would be many years, but the median is only 10 weeks. So we saw earlier that the time it takes uh, between first request and death is about six and a half weeks. Um, the sort of uh, time the physician know the patient is about 10 weeks before they provide the prescription. And when we talk about making sort of decision in medicine, um, especially this is like the true life and death decision, it's a powerful decision, but is 10 weeks enough for us to understand that this is truly, you know, what matters to the patient. The law does not mandate any specific duration, but maybe it's another safeguard that needs to be considered. Um, looking at sort of the circumstances around death on Oregon patients, we know that a uh, majority of them uh, are enrolled in hospice, so that's like sort of very good, um, like 96, 95 percent or so. Majority die at home as they wish. That's also very good at well as well. Um, 
very few physicians who prescribed a medication um, were present at time of death. And we were just talking about complications associated with ingesting the medication. Should physician be there to help alleviate those complications? Um, that is not required by laws by any means. And I think it's there's not a simple answer to this question because you can imagine the effect it would have on a physician watching a patient, you know, um, essentially ending their life by a medication that they provide. And this quote by uh, Dr. Gabbett sort of summarized this. Um, and, you know, at the bottom part where she said, the doctor's own anxiety in the face of death and even the hatred of the patient who does not want treatment or will not allow the doctor to be helpful can influence a supposedly scientific or rational decision. And here you talk a lot about countertransference. So how, how does, you know, the patient request affect us? And once we, you know, sort of uh, decided that we may or may not help them going through with this request, how does that affect us as clinicians? And, you know, we should sort of reflect on our own values. Is it the right thing to do by the patient? Is it the right thing for me to do? Uh, do I feel sad? Do I feel angry? Do I feel shocked? So there are a lot of emotions that going on when you first hear the request and when you try to work with the patient to understand where they come from, there's a tremendous impact on a physician and we have to acknowledge acknowledge that be, be, before we can actually form a plan of care that doesn't diminish the patient-physician relationship. Um, so how should physician respond to uh, aid in dying requests? Um, and um, in this article, it sort of summarized a few strategy um, on how to do so, uh, regardless of whether or not the physician uh, support or oppose uh, the idea of medical aid in dying. And the first and most important thing is to acknowledge um, the patient uh, request and emotion. You have had enough and life just isn't worth living anymore. Um, and of course, it's an important to clarify the underlying causes. So tell me more. What's the worst part of your condition right now for you? Uh, it's important to evaluate for depression and risk of suicide based on the data that we saw earlier. And one of the ways to ask that is, in your worst moments, do you find yourself wishing that death would come soon? And last but not least, especially for physicians who don't agree with uh, providing um, medical aid in dying, um, it's important that we reiterate our commitment to the patient. And we can say that, you know, how can I help you short of ending your life to get through this terrible time? And it's important because a lot of patients with existential crisis feel very isolated. And we want to make sure that we are there with them along the way, regardless of whatever our personal belief systems are. Uh, we can also, talk to the patient to explore other alternatives to uh, aid in dying. Uh, for example, we have palliative sedation and voluntary stopping eating and drinking. Both of these options are legal um, anywhere in the US uh, and uh, could be done you know, when the patient is under the care of a palliative care physician. Um, for patients who really want to have control over the timing of their death, this second option uh, actually becomes very important and should be explored with that uh, patient. Um, and we know that usually patients who go on palliative sedation, they're too symptomatic to have like sort of a meaningful discussion and you usually have to talk to their uh, uh, care provider, um, their uh, family to make that decision. And of course, in consultation with other palliative care physicians. And uh, in summary, uh, I just want to uh, emphasize a few points. Patients who request physician aid in dying are more concerned with losing autonomy and future suffering than current physical symptoms. The desire for haste and death fluctuate over the trajectory of a patient's illness, which requires continuing reassessment by the physician in order to provide optimal palliative care. And exploring alternative options for intractable suffering is an important aspect of addressing medical aid in dying requests and in response to such requests, we should create a safe space where patients feel empowered to have a response shift. 
these are my references. And I just want to take a few minutes to acknowledge uh, my mentor, Dr. Andrew Lawton, who's here today. And special thanks to Dr. Susan Block, who's not here, uh, but she was helping me with brainstorming uh, for the uh, topic, the presentation, and helped me reviewing the final slides. And thank you to uh, my fellowship director, Dr. Kathleen Doyle and Jane DeLima Thomas, and also to my uh, classmate from the fellowship class of 2019. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex. That was wonderful, and it really helped to add a lot of depth and data to a conversation that can often be adversarial, two sides saying, is this right, is this wrong? I want to open it up for questions. Hi, great lecture. Uh, so did you... Um, come across with or are in the literature about patients with a cognitive impairment. <clears throat> Could you repeat the question, so, please? Is there any literature about patients with a cognitive impairment going through this, all this? And then it, I can imagine how challenging would it be to assess for depression in that setting and then kind of because like choices can change, like you said. So, are there any studies or anything about that? Yeah. Um, so uh, if I may rephrase the question is that for a patient with cognitive impairment, um, how does this sort of affect them, you know, um, are they even qualified for sort of physician aid in dying and how to help them if such a request was uh, expressed? Um, I think based on the current laws, uh, patient with dementia also excluded from um, physician aid in dying because the law required that the patient uh, themselves have to be able to ind independently make that decision. And so if anything, any, uh, even though in the law doesn't say neurological impairment, anyone who's deemed to have impaired judgment would not uh, be allowed to go through with the law. So in a way, uh, from the legal sort of uh, perspective, uh, you know, um, people who are, are uh, proponent of, of physician aid in dying say that the law is biased against people with disabilities, with uh, long-standing uh, intractable psychiatric illness, and also patient with sort of ne neurological impairment. Um, so dementia patient, unfortunately, uh, is not, you know, one of the diagnoses that could be used for physician aid in dying. Yeah. I'm so, I think uh, palliative sedation is kind of a trick phase, a phrase. If you sedate somebody to unconsciousness, as you said, and days later they die of dehydration, if that's, uh, isn't that euthanasia? Yeah, and I think that you're right. In a lot of the earlier studies about um, uh, the, you know, using the term euthanasia and asking physician how they view about it, uh, Physician in the past view euthanasia as not just, you know, injecting a lethal prescription. They really think about sort of uh, withdrawing life support and also giving palliative sedation. And I think the difference here is that the intention. So in physician aid in dying, the intention is that you want to end someone uh, suffering by ending life. In the case of palliative sedation, um, you know, of course, you're not making an individual uh, assessment. You have other palliative care physician as well. But the idea is that you are essentially using the double effect, and you are focusing on treating the symptoms. And you know, of course, rarely do we see patient wake up from palliative sedation. But you see day only to the point where the symptoms are well controlled. You don't intend on ending their life, and I think the intention makes that difference. But if your goal is to palliate symptoms and they're unconscious, how do you know whether you're overdoing it a little bit? And I think as clinician, we have to be uh, very in tune with assessing patient based on nonverbal cues. And we are taught about it a lot in palliative care. And I think that, you know, when we assess him for pain, for example, we look at our patient grimacing, are they frowning their brows, and are they groaning, are they agitated? And so we treat them based on those nonverbal cues, even though they're not able to verbalize to us that they are in distress. I think the nonverbal thing works in dementia, but if a person is unconscious, are, are you trying to access their inner experience by vocalizations? 
No, and I don't think that, I don't want to sort of demean uh, existential distress because a lot of time that cannot be expressed, you know, physically, but I think that that's why having chaplains involved on board for these patients is very important and knowing their wish and desire is the most important of all. I just to pick up on your last comment about their desires the most important at all. I saw that autonomy is the number one reason there. And Massachusetts, this uh, law keeps either being voted down or die in committee, and they don't really bring it to a vote. But the testimony of the and just over a year ago now of the most recent uh, iteration of the bill, to uh, many of the physician um, arguments are very similar to the ones you posed here. But when you listen to um, the patients, uh, some terminally ill patients that testified, or the family members that testified, uh, theirs was very compelling. Uh, um, there's uh, just one comment on the very short um, time frame that some of the patients experienced. That can be from um, sort of medical refugee, because mm -hmm. people in the other 47 states need to try and travel to one of the seven states that should they truly desire to be autonomous and not take sort of a three billboards uh, act, mm -hmm. um, then they're going to try and travel to those states, establish a relationship, and very quickly end it. But one of the, uh, it was a wife of a patient who testified that um, we're going to be able to help you, we're going to be able to help you, we're going to be able to help you as her husband declined to the point that he couldn't travel and then just had to suffer death when he couldn't even make it to Vermont. You know, so I I think there is a, another whole side that... Yeah, you know, and I fun. think that um, I'm not a legal expert, expert, but in terms of people traveling uh, to seek a physician and dying, um, actually, the European laws are more lax compared to the state laws in those states that legalize physician-assisted um, death. And a lot, I have patients in my own clinic, uh, you know, here uh, during fellowship who you know, was adamant that she would travel to Europe to have this done when the time comes. And, and the reason because you have to establish residency in these states. And different states have different rules about what it means to be a resident. So you can imagine if your prognosis is four weeks and you have to go there and establish residence, it can take a lot of time before you can actually get to a physician and get the request process. So there are a lot of sort of loopholes as well in how to do this. And I can imagine for someone to be that distressed to travel across the country, pay a lot of money um, to establish residence just to die, I think that there's something to be said sort of about us still not being able to find really effective way of treating the existential distress uh, for this patient because there's not like a magic pill that we could give, you know, unlike when we treat pain or agitation, you know, those like physical symptoms. Yeah. I want to see if there are any questions at Dana Farber at Care Dimensions. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have more questions here then. Thanks, that was an excellent summary. You hit a lot of the really important um, papers and data. And I was wondering, um, data in this space is a little bit endangered because some of the advocacy organizations will lobby against including data collection as part of the laws. Um, in doing your literature review, which pieces of data, like what, um, measures were most helpful for you to kind of tell this story? Like what things do you think are most important to preserve? Yeah, I think it's hard to look at this topic and sort of become in a way unbiased. And um, a lot of the data are, you know, qualitative, you know, studies. And you're right, the advocacy organization, when they screen this patient for this study, if you are depressed, um, if you have sort of anything that sort of become a red flag, they screen you out. So we don't understand the distress from those patients, but also for the patient that are enrolled, like how do you come up with a scale to sort of like measure the data? And the, the few items that have been used in a lot of these qualitative studies is that they sort of use this uh, standardized uh, schedule attitudes toward haste and death. That's one thing that they use sort of assessing the patient. And that could be done 
in clinic on a regular basis, just similar to when you use a PHQ-9 for depression, for example, and there's like a hopelessness scale that can be done as well. Um, it's been validated, uh, you know, in patients with serious illness. Um, I don't know if it's been very uh, validated specifically for the patient population that seek physician aid in dying, however. Um, I think that it would be interesting to see the data from the other states, not just Oregon, because Oregon has done extensive research, uh, not research, but collection. And we haven't gotten a lot of data from Washington or California um, or other states, for example. So that would be also interesting to look at as well. And I also want to, sorry, I also want to take a look at um, sort of like patient distribution based on zip code, because you can imagine people in metropolitan area versus people in rural area when you have access to a physician who's willing to provide it versus when you have you don't have any physician who's willing to provide it as well. So that would be interesting to see. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. This is really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.